Georgia's DBHDD has an urgent health warning. One of every 10 counterfeit pills contain fentanyl, a powerful and very deadly drug. Pills from friends or dealers are unsafe, and one pill can cause an overdose. More info at opioidresponse.info. Welcome to the new Georgia Today podcast from GPB News. Today is Monday, January 23rd. I'm Peter Biello. On today's episode, protests in Atlanta turned violent over the weekend. The CDC wants to help stop accidental fentanyl overdoses. And a new flag is now flying over Macon City Hall. These stories and more are coming up on this edition of Georgia Today. A Fulton County judge is weighing how much of a recent report from the Fulton County Grand Jury investigating election interference should be made public. GPB's Stephen Fowler has more on tomorrow's court proceedings. For the last eight months, the special purpose grand jury requested by Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis has heard testimony from countless witnesses about efforts to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia. The grand jury can't issue indictments, but can write a report with recommendations. So now, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney will hear arguments from the DA's office, as well as potential targets of the investigation, about what, if any, parts of that report should be public. A group of news outlets has also filed a motion arguing the entire report should be made public. For GPB News, I'm Stephen Fowler. A protest turned violent in downtown Atlanta on Saturday night in the wake of the death of an environmental activist who was killed last week after authorities said the 26-year-old shot a state trooper. Masked activists dressed in all black threw rocks and lit fireworks in front of a skyscraper that houses the Atlanta Police Foundation, shattering large glass windows. They then lit a police car on fire and vandalized other buildings with anti-police graffiti. The violent protesters were among hundreds of demonstrators who had gathered and marched up Peachtree Street to mourn the death of the protester, Manuel Turan. Turan was killed last Wednesday as authorities cleared a small group of protesters from the site of a planned Atlanta area public safety training center that activists have dubbed Cop City. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation has said Turan was killed after shooting and injuring a state trooper, but activists have questioned officials' version of events, calling it a murder and demanding an independent investigation. The GBI says it has received confirmation from a firearms transaction record that in September 2020, Tehran legally purchased the firearm that was used in the shooting of a GSP trooper. Word of Saturday's protest has been widely circulated ahead of time on social media and among leftist activists, with some passing out flyers that read, Police killed a protester, stand up, fight back. A police statement said the protesters damaged property at several locations along Peachtree Street, a corridor of hotels and restaurants, adding that several arrests were made and order was quickly restored to the downtown space. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens says peaceful protests are welcome in Atlanta, but violence will not be tolerated. Speaking on CBS's Face the Nation yesterday, Dickens said many groups called for better police training after the 2020 police killing of George Floyd but don't seem to want that training to happen. We can't train uh, imaginary. We have to do it in a facility that allows for police, firefighters, and the community to train together. And so this is bringing about the change that we wanted to see in 2020. And now while we're doing it, these individuals don't want to see any resources go towards that. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, U.S. life expectancy fell for the second year in a row. They cite 2022 deaths from COVID-19 and drug overdoses, but as GPB's Ellen Eldridge reports, a new program could address at least one of the causes. Fentanyl is a deadly opioid that is increasingly found in illegal drugs like pain pills, cocaine, and even marijuana. Daryl Carver with the Fulton County Board of Health says they will partner with organizations to provide fentanyl test strips so people can check drugs for its presence. The campaign will also connect people to other resources. Eventually, when they keep coming back to us on the regular for these tools and we build a relationship with them, it's really easy to then uh, build a a relationship of trust uh, and support so that when people are ready to make other decisions in their lives, we're here for it and can help navigate them accordingly. Free fentanyl test strips are available in health centers where folks can receive HIV resources. For GPB News, I'm Ellen Eldridge. Leaders of Macon Bibb County raised the flag of the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma over Macon City Hall Friday in a public ceremony between local and tribal leaders. GPB's Grant Blankenship explains. 
The bond between Macon and the Muscogee Nation has strengthened during the effort to create Georgia's first national park at the Atmogi Mound site, which the Muscogee considered part of their ancestral home. But as a nation, the Muscogee have not lived in Georgia for 200 years. As was explained in the reading of the land acknowledgement, the Bibb County Commission recently voted to enshrine into the county code. In 1821, the Muscogee Creek people were forced to relinquish this land. In his remarks, Muscogee Principal Chief David Hill said people may then wonder why he and others still feel a connection to Georgia. This is where our people are buried. Our stories are still here. Unless some future county commission votes to remove it, the flag of the Muscogee Nation will fly above Macon City Hall forever. For GPB News, I'm Grant Blankenship in Macon. A collaboration between the Bibb County Sheriff's Office and one of the state's largest providers of mental health care will create the first mental health co-responder unit in central Georgia. GPB's Sophie Gratis has more. Signatures on a couple of agreements made Bibb County's mental health co-responder unit official last Wednesday. Okay. All right. This is like buying a house. <laughs> <laughs> the new partnership between law enforcement and River Edge Behavioral Center will help officers better respond to mental health crises by placing experts within easy reach of officers. William Barnes is the senior director at River Edge. We only have funding for one person, but we know it's a 24-hour issue. So 24 hours a day, the sheriff's teams will be able to call our facility and get a consult when our person isn't available. People who need additional support after intervention will be transferred to a new River Edge Mental Health Center rather than to the county jail. For GPB News, I'm Sophie Gratis in Macon. Protesters who have been camped out for months in opposition to the construction of a police training center in an Atlanta forest are mourning the loss of Manuel Tehran. The 26-year-old protester was shot and killed last week by law enforcement who claimed Tehran shot first, wounding a state trooper. The shooting has inflamed tensions between protesters and police, which persisted over the weekend as a protest in downtown Atlanta turned violent. Joining me now is David Peisner, who's been covering the story for The Bitter Southerner. He spoke with Tehran and other protesters for months. Thank you very much for speaking with me, David. Thanks for having me. Let's talk a little bit about Manuel. Over the course of your reporting, you got to know them and we should mention that we are re- using they, them pronouns for Manuel Tehran as they preferred. Who was Manuel Tehran to you? Manny was first and foremost a source. They were someone I met when I first went down uh, to start reporting on, uh, on what was going on down in the forest. Manny was an intelligent, thoughtful funny, self-aware person. I didn't know Manny socially. I, we weren't friends, but we did spend a lot of time talking. I wouldn't presume to be able to speak for Manny or for, or for the Defend the Forest movement or for even the wider movement of, of, of people, activists who are trying to uh, protect the, whole, the South River Forest. I was a journalist working on a story. As far as I understand it, Manny was not from Georgia. I imagine in the course of your conversations with them, you spoke a bit about their motivations, why they were there, why they were protesting. What did they say about why they were there? On a very like specific level, um, Manny came to the forest for what they called a week of action. Um, these were things that the, the forest defenders would have to kind of promote what was going on down there uh, within the sort of activist community. And when was that week of action? I don't know exactly. Um, it was, uh, so I, uh, th- this conversation I had with Manny would have been in August, and he had, uh, they had been down there um, st- at least several months at that point, but it could have been at any time, you know, probably r- early in 2022. Mm-hmm. But uh, Manny had come down for the week of action, and as they put it to me, really just fell in love with the forest and fell in love with living there. The way they put it was, I love being a forest hobo. So really fell in love with the forest, but it was, uh, had a really deep commitment to environmental and social justice issues. Mm-hmm. And you spoke with other people protesting in the forest as well. I'm wondering how much Manny's motivations were shared by those you spoke with. They were broadly shared. Um, I mean, I mean, I think that that, that would, would be the case. You know, it's, it's a tricky thing because this movement is a, an autonomous, decentralized movement. So there, there are no leaders. There's no, no one's in charge of anyone else. 
And so everyone's essentially, you know, part of a movement, but not really part of a group, if that makes any sense. If someone else's tactics don't match their tactics, so in other words, if somebody is um, setting fire to uh, construction machinery and uh, someone else doesn't agree with that, those people can coexist in this same movement uh, without sort of uh, taking responsibility for that person's actions. This is kind of a complicated um, setup, and it's one that is a distinction that people outside this movement do not make. It's been a little bit of a problem because certainly elected officials, police will paint the movement in broad strokes as being violent or uh, destructive, even though the movement will, will sort of lean on this autonomous, decentralized structure to say, look, I'm responsible for what I do, not for what anyone else is doing. In reality, the distinctions aren't being made broadly, and the, the whole movement gets tarnished by these sorts of actions, I guess. You write in The Bitter Southerner that Manny was against violence in protests. The police allege that they fired first and say they have the gun that they allegedly used. So how do you square what they said about their position on nonviolence with what the police are saying now? I mean, there's a disconnect for me, too. We spoke at length about nonviolence, about nonviolent resistance, about tactically how uh, nonviolence was the only way that this was going to work. The way Manny put it, and I'm, I'm, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something to the effect of, we're not going to out-violence the police. They're good at violence. We're not. For me, the way that I have to reconcile that is one of a couple of ways. One, the, the official narrative is not correct. I should say, I have no idea what happened. If it did happen that way, if it did happen exactly as the police laid out or close to as, as the police laid out, there are a couple of ways I could think about it, which is that one, Manny was playing me, uh, that they were uh, telling me what they thought I wanted to hear, what they thought would look good in print, and that is an absolute possibility. There is also a possibility that Manny's views changed. You mentioned that this is a decentralized movement, and to some extent that could be problematic for those, especially those who want this to be a nonviolent movement. Does that decentralization also make it hard to actually sit down at the table with law enforcement? Because whoever you have at the table with law enforcement doesn't have any sway over those who refuse to negotiate and who have just one goal, all or nothing sure. in mind. Sure. I mean, that's that was so many conversations I had during my reporting. If no one can negotiate, uh, the, the way I put it was it's unreasonable by design. Like, no one can negotiate. There's no... Sure, you could, you could... There were people who had been down there longer, who had sort of more moral authority maybe within this group. Um, and maybe the police or, or law enforcement or politicians could have sat down with them and said, you know, is there something we could work out? My guess is that they wouldn't have even sat down with them. But let's say that they did. They had sat down with them. And that person might have said, OK, what the, what, what, the, what the politicians and the police are offering here is reasonable. They're going to sh shrink the footprint or maybe they're going to move this to, to someplace else. There's a parking lot in DeKalb County that's not being used and they're going to move the whole thing there and there's going to be no destruction of a forest. And, and that sounds reasonable. And we agree with that. That person has no authority to then say, all right, we're leaving. But some people just liked living down there. Some people literally said to me, I'm not leaving no matter what. This is my home now. I like living in the forest. And I think that's really problematic for this movement because, you know, they were – those people would say, oh, well, it's squatters' rights. Why – you know, this is public land. Why shouldn't I be – okay. Like those are, those are legitimate arguments to make. But that's not the arguments that are being made sort of by the al their allies outside the forest. And there's such a, a – a, a movement, a, a sort of a impulse to turn this story in, into two sides, that there's the, the forest offenders and there's the cops. And, you know, you're on one side or you're the other. And unfortunately, like, that's the way it kept going until the forest offenders and the cop had this confrontation and two people were shot and one of them was killed. But there are actually a lot of other people involved, a lot of other, uh, you know, people on both sides. Who would those be? Those would be, you know, local activists, 
local activists. People who care but are not parked in the forest right now. Right. People who weren't living down in the forest, but they may, they lived nearby. They were concerned about uh, policing issues. They were, con- But they weren't necessarily about, we need to abolish the police. Their South River Watershed Alliance, the South River Forest Coalition, uh, group the Great Park Conservancy, which is on the other side. They wanted to see development in their neighborhood. These are some people who live nearby. The, the area this is in has been neglected for years and years and years. And they wanted to see positive development, a new park, a new... And I don't think that those people are unreasonable. And if you could have gotten the unreasonable, the, the reasonable people talking, maybe, maybe this doesn't come to the point that it came to. David Peisner has been writing about the protests over Atlanta's plan to build a police training facility in South River Forest for the Bitter Southerner. You can find a link to his work at gpb.org. David, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thanks so much. A recent merger between Kroger and Albertsons has led the companies to close stores in several states, including in Georgia. GPB's Amanda Andrews explains how Metro Atlanta officials are helping residents after one store, affectionately known as Little or Baby Kroger, shut down after more than 20 years in Decatur. Downtown Decatur is known for its walkability, but the Kroger, the last supermarket within walking distance for many residents, closed last month. In response, the city of Decatur and the local publics are teaming up with Let's Ride Atlanta, an electric shuttle service, to offer rides to the nearby Publix through mid-April. Operations manager Shondell Cooper says their rides will help reach seniors that public buses don't service. There's no routes that come from, you know, a lot of these senior home communities directly to the public. It's just a more convenient way for a lot of folks to have a bit of more on-demand service. Kroger also closed a store in Buckhead mirroring a national trend of mergers and subsequent closures. For GPB News, I'm Amanda Andrews. And that is it for today's edition of Georgia Today. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe to the podcast yet, please do so now, so that way we pop up in your feed tomorrow. And if you've got feedback, we'd love to hear it. Email us at georgiatoday at gpb.org. I'm Peter Biello. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.